and it's the center of the debate, and it's clear the motion is science refutes God. And Michael and I have the distinct advantage here of arguing in favor of the motion because, in fact, we have evidence, reason, logic, rationality, and empirical methods on our side, whereas their opponents have vague hopes and fears. And uh, they're arguing in favor of a motion that's hanging on for its existence by mere shreds of emotional and ideological spaghetti, much like this type provided by the flying spaghetti monster, one of the many equally irrational gods which science provides no support for. But I first want to begin by clarifying the nature of the motion, because the motion isn't science disproves God, it's science refutes God. And that's very important, because you can't disprove a notion that's basically vague and unfalsifiable. I could not, I, there's no way to disprove the notion that God didn't create all of us 15 seconds ago with the memories of, of the amusing comments we heard before that. There's no way we can disprove that. Okay, and, and it, that's really important to recognize that those kind of unfalsifiable notions are unfalsifiable, as I say. But we can ask, is it rational to expect that that's likely? And tonight I want to emphasize that 500 years of science have demonstrated that God, that vague notion, is not likely. It's irrational to believe in God. Now, to refute God means refuting several claims. One that are all based on faith, not evidence. One, that God is necessary. Two, that there is evidence for God. And three, that that belief is rational. And the point is that the progress of science has shown over and over and over again that all the answers to all those three questions are no, 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 no. Now, my own scientific field is cosmology, and uh, that's a study of the origin and evolution of the universe as a whole. And it's where science and religion sort of confront each other and creation myths have abounded throughout human history, and science confronts those creation myths. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, at some point in the, in, in the debate. But I want to point out that our opponents, I, I'm pretty sure, are going to argue first that one aspect of science that supports, perhaps, the belief in God is this notion that the universe is apparently fine-tuned for life. I hear that a lot. And because uh, it was fine-tuned so life could exist, that is a remarkable and, in fact, cosmic misunderstanding. Because it's the same kind of misunderstanding that led people to believe in special creation for life on Earth before Darwin. It looked like everything was designed for the environment in which it lived. But what Darwin showed us was that a simple proposition, namely that there's genetic variation among a population combined with natural selection, meant that you didn't need supernatural shenanigans. That in fact all the diversity of life on Earth could arise from a single life form by natural law. And he didn't know, he, what he showed was it was plausible based on the evidence. He didn't know about DNA, he didn't know about uh, the details of genetic replication, but he showed it was plausible. And as I'll say, that's where we're at now as far as the understanding of the universe is concerned. Now, our, my opponents, I suspect, will, will argue the universe is equally fine-tuned for life, and they, in fact, uh, they'll point out that certain fundamental parameters in nature, if they were different, we couldn't exist. Or they may boldly assert that, in fact, certain of these parameters are so strange and unnatural that they must have been established with malice of forethought, a forethought to ensure our existence. This, too, is an illusion. Just as bees need to see the color of flowers, but they're not designed to do it, if they couldn't see them, they couldn't get the nectar and reproduce. So what we're seeing here is a version of cosmic natural selection. We would be quite surprised to find ourselves living in a universe in which we couldn't live. In fact, that might be evidence for God. So for, I really, I come here not to bury God, but to praise honesty, full disclosure, and skeptical empirical inquiry, which alas, are burying God. And, but that's the key thing I want to talk about. And, and so before I, since I believe in full disclosure, I thought I'd give some full disclosure, which is my biases. What really matters to me is the ethics of science, open questioning, the fact that there are no scientific authorities, that we believe in honesty, transparency, reliance on evidence, peer review, and testability. All of these, I believe, make the world a better place. And they do so specifically by bearing myth and superstition and dogma. Well, I think maybe that might help kids outgrow their parents.
What? I mean, the, getting religion forced down your throat is one of the best ways for kids to for reject some kids. it as they get older. For some kids. For some kids. Kids yeah. like you and me. But I get lots of letters. You know, we made this movie called The Unbelievers, and, and about, which followed Mitch, Richard Dawkins and I around the world as we talked about this stuff. And it was nice, and maybe, and I, and I hope, and it's, it's a well-made film. I like the filmmakers who made it. But I found people come up to me. I had no idea of this. It's one of the negative aspects of religion that I never appreciated. I have people come up to me almost every day. I write me and saying, you know what? I saw that movie and I realized I'm not a bad person for asking questions and I'm not alone. You know, these people from small towns in Georgia, they have no one to talk to. They think they're the only ones who's asked the question, is God real? Is it okay to not believe in God? And they're told by everyone else, not only you'll go to hell, but you're a bad person. And suddenly they discover that's not true. And so I think there are a lot of people who have that force down their throats. It's really hard when you're a kid, you know, and have these. And that's why I do think any kind of religion for kids is kind of child abuse. Not and no matter what, because these concepts of a deity and the possible existence of a purpose of the universe are very deep and subtle concepts. And to expect a three-year-old kid to 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 ram that down a three-year-old kid's throat is unfair because the kid can't address it. It, it ends up being internalized in ways. And a lot of people, you know, I hear a lot of people who've had deep religious educations who say, you know, it's hard to outgrow that because when you get, when that's thrust into you as a child, it's really hard to over, ever overcome it. The guilt feelings that many religions I- introduce, the fundamental notion that, that, you know, you're ultimately sinful and no matter what you do is sinful is something a lot of people have hard times with. And, and that claim of sin is just so, you know, I've debated people uh, who you know who argue that homosexuality is 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 sinful you know and then and it's unnatural god intended it to be otherwise and then i point out well you know what you take all mammals 10 percent in every species almost 10 percent have homosexual relationships sheep have long 10 percent of sheep have long-term homosexual relationships are they sinful Okay, it's not unnatural at all. It's a natural consequence of whatever... Now, why it's a case, it's an interesting evolutionary question, but it's certainly not unnatural. It seems but, uniform, then, if it's 10%. Yeah, it's a, well, you know, plus or minus a little bit. Right, it certainly close. seems to be biology. There's some purpose. There's some, there's some biological purpose to it. Mm, and so decorating. to argue that it's both unnatural and wrong is to misunderstand biology, but people grow up being told it's evil because the Bible said it, Right. And then they don't want to give people who are homosexual the same rights as other people because they tell them, they say God didn't want them to have the homosexual. So the problem is people are told these things that are ultimately wrong because, you know, maybe, you know, because for whatever reason, the tribe that wrote down that that scripture wanted to make sure that the, there weren't homosexual relationships in the group. Well, it's really baffling when you talk to people about the Bible and the Old Testament versus Mm. the New Testament, and they don't even understand where the New Testament was created by Constantine and a bunch of bishops. They threw a bunch of stuff out. And by the way, they think it's kinder or gentler. Sure, the Old Testament is one of the most, you know, look at the Quran. People say the Quran is violent and vicious. Read the Old Testament. You know, you're supposed to stone your kids if they disobey you. Yeah. And and the reason... Supposed to kill people that wear two different kinds of cloth. Exactly. And the reason that... Nowadays, sort of the old Abrahamic religions of Judaism and Christianity may seem a little less violent than Islam for some people, is because, you know, people take the Quran literally. It, it, that's part of sort of fundamentalism. Very few, very few people take the Bible as literally as, uh, namely, hey, we're going to stone kids. In the 12th century, they may have, but now we've outgrown it. And the Islam is 600 years younger. And so it's it's just the Old Testament is just as violent as the Quran, but no one takes it seriously. But people, most people who call themselves religious, they pick and choose the things they like from the Bible or the New Testament or the Old Testament. They pick and choose the nice, kindler, gentler things. You know, Richard Dawkins uh, Foundation in England did an interesting survey. So, so arguing that something doesn't make sense to you is based on the fact that you uh, the assumption that you know what's sensible in advance. But we don't know what's sensible in advance until we explore the world around us. Our common sense derived from the fact that we evolved on the savanna in Africa to avoid lions, not to understand quantum mechanics, for example. As I've often said, common sense, our deductive, our deductions might suggest that you cannot be in two places at once. That is crazy. But of course, an electron not only can be, but it is. It doesn't make sense 
Because we didn't evolve to know about it. We've learned about it. We force our idea of common sense to change. It's called learning. Some people would rather read an ancient book than learn. And this has been a very good evidence of that. For example, to say something is inconceivable just means you can't conceive it. But the great thing about the universe, and the reason that I do science, is that the universe has a much greater imagination than we do. In fact, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And that's what's wonderful about the universe. Things that are inconceivable happen all the time. And what, we, what that does is that expands our mind. And expanding our minds to conform to the evidence of reality is common sense. I would say morality is impossible without science. That's the point. Because, and, and religion is an example, as I, can't, as I say, I can't think of a more immoral document than the Old Testament. But, but the, the point is, if you don't know the consequences of your actions, then you can't even decide what's right and wrong. And so, to, to, to take, to, to make the, and so we have seen people's morality, if you want to call it morality, change. Slavery might have been okay because you might have believed that certain groups were inferior or not human. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed, as almost all religions do, that women are chattel. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed that homosexuality is evil. But science has told us that all mammalian species have homosexuality. That's, there's nothing in unnatural or evil about it. So to, to have a morality without science is empty. It's a beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of a distant galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. And, uh, and there's a whole galaxy. It's about a billion light years away. We're looking at it as it looked a billion years ago. So, so many of those stars no longer exist. And here's an object that's just a, a, as bright as the whole center of the galaxy. You'd think it's a star that's near in our galaxy that just got caught in the picture frame. It's not. It's a star on the edge of that galaxy that has exploded. And exploding stars shine with the brightness of 10 billion stars. They're the brightest fireworks in the universe, supernovae. And they're remarkable. And I, I keep having asides. Maybe I'll get to my point eventually. But um, the, the, um, this is something that, that, that I wrote a whole book about. And someone asked me yesterday why I wrote that book. Because it is the most poetic thing I know about the universe. Um, Richard wrote a great book called, our, uh, called, what's it called? Our Ancestors? What's it called? Ancestor's Tale, yes, I, I wanted to make sure I got that right. Uh, and, and I wrote a book that was a different Ancestor's Tale, it was called Adam. But the amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars, and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Okay? And, and anyway. But the Islamic God, much like the Judeo-Christian God, is a real creep. This is a God worse than Saddam Hussein. Instead of tor torturing you just for your life, tortures you for infinity, forgive me the word, but eternity, let me use that word, eternity for not believing. For not believing, you're tortured for infinity. The tortures are actually described in the Quran, and you know it as well as I do. And the point is, if you just ask yourself common sense, if you were a divine being, say you had an ant colony that you made in your house, would you be offended if those ants didn't pay homage to you five, to, well, let's start with 50 times a day before Muhammad cut it down to 30 and then five. Would you be offended if those ants didn't pay homage to you five times a day? And if they didn't, if they didn't look up to you or didn't recognize your existence, would you destroy them? No, I mean, it just seems so petty. So why should we believe in a hateful, unmerciful, petty, sadomasochistic, homophobic, sexist God? It's just irrational. It's not sensible. Of course religion is outdated in the 21st century. Um, most religious people, to respond, it's, it's true that you may get many people saying they're religious, but none of them, uh, to, in the first world at least, in the developed world, to first approximation, actually believe the doctrines of their faith. They like to be religious. They want to believe, to use something from the X-Files. They, they, they want to believe in believing. So that 
Catholics don't really believe that when, they, that when a priest holds a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ. No one really believes that nonsense. I have, in the last week, for, for spent more time talking to Jewish atheists than, than I can count. Most of the Jews I know are atheists, and they say it's perfectly reasonable to be Jewish atheists because there's other aspects of the Jewish religion they like. So the point is that the doctrines of religion w are outdated, and that's for good reason. They were created by Bronze Age or Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the sun. So, those, so the wisdom in those books is not wisdom at all. And people take the wisdom. In fact, we've actually learned something over the last 20 centuries, and, and science has taught us how the world works. Now, for science, the interesting thing as a scientist is that uh, God is completely irrelevant to science. Sci most scientists don't spend enough time thinking about God to even know if they're atheists because they try and understand how the world works, and God never enters into it. It's, ju it's just completely irrelevant. And in fact, the more we've learned about the natural world, the more we've learned that you don't need any divine intervention to explain anything. As far as morality is concerned and the person you want to be, which is really what, what I think is, is the heart of what, what religion, when religion provides many things for people, and we can't deny that. The question is, how can we take the things that people need, community, uh, support, hope, and, and use the real world to build those quantities? Because religion, if you base your beliefs and your actions on myths that are incorrect, you're ine inevitably going to take irrational actions. And so what we want to do is, is, is what science does, which is force people's beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around, and not assume the answers to questions before we even ask them, and use the rational world to build a global society, not an exclusionary society, but a global world where people can live together based on the reality that we're all humans sharing this planet, and we need to work together to build a better place. A morality based on rationality and not outmoded religious beliefs.